It is an adrenaline rush like you've never felt in your life. And then they just finally came up to me. Aren't you that case in for the judge? I'm going to go do some Mensa or something. You, no, you have to be I am a Mensa member. I have to be invited. Here now is Matt Austin and Ginger Gadsden with Florida's Fourth Estate. Sponsored by Light Orlando. Delivering hope together. What were you doing when you were 16 years old? I personally had just learned how to tie my shoes and was super proud. <laughs> we have a 16-year-old who is about to make you and your oh children God. probably feel bad about themselves, uh, but only because of the amazing things she is doing. And uh, I'm excited to introduce you to her today. I'm Matt Austin. And I'm Ginger Gadsden, but you're not going to care about us in about five seconds because we're <laughs> going to introduce you to Tiffany Gay. She is a sophomore, 16 years old, at the Orla Orlando Science School. You are one of those rare uh, individuals where you're doing something locally that will have a global impact. And I don't mean that lightly because you have something on the table right now that could possibly help 2.2 billion visually impaired people. Tiffany, we're so happy to have you here. First of all, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity. Yes. I'm so grateful to be here and I'm humbled by the opportunity to present my project on this large of a scale. But what I developed was a LiDAR navigational system to help people who are visually impaired. And this idea stemmed from experience with a family friend who had a visual impairment. And I watched as her vision degenerated over time. And I wanted to develop a device that was able to help people with visual impairments adapt to their environment through a way that was really comfortable to me, which is through electronics. And I've had a lot of experience developing products like this in the past. And so this is one of the many products I've developed. Okay, wow. <laughs> yeah, we have to, okay, so if we could take the shot of what we're looking at here, because yeah. this is, okay, so these are the many iterations that has taken to get to what is probably not even the final one, I would imagine. Yeah. But, so the two, the two most recent ones are these yes. right here. And can I pick it up? Is that yeah, okay? Yeah, I don't want to break it, it but uh, watch me break it. I know. So you basically, so tell us how this works. You put this around your head, yes. right, if you're visually impaired, and then it's got little sensors and LIDAR mm -hmm. all around it. If you look, you can see this. And it basically senses when something is close by. Explain it better than I can. Yes. So <laughs> there are multiple different LIDAR sensors around the brim of the device. And what that's going to do is topographically map the user's environment. So it's understanding it through electronics, right? Mm -hmm. Th those sensors are kind of replicating human vision. And then how is that information going to be relayed to someone who's visually impaired, right? You can't use lights. You can't use something right. that they can see. So I decided to use what's called haptic feedback. So how, are you guys familiar? Like, so like vibration. Phones, vibration, right? yeah. exactly yeah. like what's on your phone. Yeah. So whenever you're texting someone and you feel those types of the tactical <laughs> feedback on yeah. your finger, that's a haptic vibration. So I have that haptic all around the brim of the device. So um, if, if someone's getting close to an obstacle, it'll start to vibrate in that region of their head. So, oh so it tells you which side it is, and it, does it vibrate harder if you're yes. really close Close's. to it? Okay. Oh my you gosh, know. that's so smart. <laughs> Why didn't we think of that? Oh, oh, I oh know. yeah, she's a lot smarter. Than that. Okay. And so I've only heard of LiDAR used in like vehicles because it determines the distance you are and helps you brake for cars, yes. right? Is that basically the same thing where you're like, near an object and it tells you, okay, slow down, you're too close or whatever. Is yes. that, that's how it Very works, right? Very similar. When do you think people who are visually impaired will be able to order one of these on Amazon or get it from their doctor <laughs> and be able to walk around and, the city? And get rid of a white cane. Yeah. Because that's one of the things that, you know, it's a, it's a stigma for people, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So I actually am currently working on the patenting process with my device. So I'm, I actually, we just got a lawyer. So we're working on the patenting process, process, which is a very long, extensive process. And I need to do a lot of testing with this device before it's available commercially. Mm -hmm. I also want to decrease the price because right now it's an estimated $200, but that's really good for medical assistive oh, devices. I was say. Yes, oh, wow. that's really good for this field, uh, for this industry but I just want it to be more accessible to more people. Yeah. So decreasing the price is uh, a significant change I want to make. I am so, I, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> no, no, you're crying. It, it, it no because, okay, I have a niece who is visually impaired and you didn't know that and I didn't know what you did until all of this started transforming. And so, um, you know, and she has a hard time sometimes and kids aren't really nice to her. Um, but just seeing what you're doing for other people and not even for yourself. Like you have good vision. 
right? But you want to help other people who do not, and you will change lives with something like this. And just hearing that, the, the non-arrogance, and just like, well, this is just what I want to do, I appreciate that, and I know that people all over the world will get to experience this and appreciate that as well. Are you even aware of the impact that you are having on, on people just like me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much for that. <laughs> um, it's, it's humbling, the, mm. the, amount of, the amount of response I've gotten from this device. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I don't even realize it. Sometimes my mom is like, wow, you're, you're, you're really doing something. Yeah. And so something that really made me realize that really recently was my mom had sent me a photo from the, the district fair. And the district coordinator had called over the, the intercom saying, oh, Tiffany won the Taiwan International Science Fair, which I got so embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> but following that, so many students, so many parents, so many teachers, so many mentors, so many engineers, highly experienced people in the field surrounded my projects. And it, it was, and I didn't realize it at the time, but mm -hmm. whenever my mom showed me a photo, yeah. it looked like everyone was looking at my project and I realized the impact that this has not just on the visually impaired community but on other students as well in terms of motivating them to get into STEM, get into science, yeah. get into research. I'm also pretty interested in medicine and like chemistry. I really like chemistry which is a slightly a contrast. I want to go into a biomedical engineering field so I want to work in creating biomedical assistive devices, things like these to help people who are not just visually impaired, but people yeah. who have any form of you know, disorder or disease. You are such an incredible young lady. What a bright light you are in this world, and we need way more people like you. I was sent a video of you in preparation for this. You're just so charismatic. I have to give credit to my mom for that. She's always pushed me um, in a supportive way. She's never been super mean to me or anything. Yeah. <laughs> she's, she's, she's always pushed me into public speaking and I've grown a lot of confidence from her as well. Mm. So I have to give credit to my parents, both of them, yeah. for always pushing me to try my best in every single thing I do, put my best foot forward in every single thing I do. So. What okay. did, what did the, okay, so your mom is actually in this room right now. Yeah. Uh, she's she's yeah, watching our every amazing, move amazing, and amazing. she is yeah. uh, the most proud parent I think I've ever seen. <laughs> she whipped these out. Yeah. I mean, they were all packaged. I'm asking and, her to take me in. <laughs> right, I know. So what, what do you think your parents have done to foster this? Like, obviously they did some things differently than say the rest of us parents are doing. So we'll give, a, give us some parenting tips. Since I was younger, they've always just been so passionate about education. And at a young age, I learned that education is very vital if you want to be successful, right? Mm -hmm. And even whenever I was six years old, she was always, whenever we were on drives, my dad would just be like, red car, red car. And I, and I would learn about my environment through them. And one time I was in daycare, I was three years old, and I was just tired of watching Dora the Explorer. So, my, so then my mom called a preparatory school, which was like crazy to me at the time, I'd never gone there. And at three years old, I started kindergarten. So I was starting school extremely early, and I was able to get experience to education at a really young age through my parents, and they've always just been so passionate about education. Tiffany Gay, it has been just amazing to, nice meet to meet you. Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you all as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna go do some Mensa or something. You, no, you have to be I invited. I am a I'm Mensa go, member, You actually. have to be invited. Get out. <laughs> just, get out. <laughs> Thank you, Tiffany. <laughs> she, of course she's a Mensa member. <laughs> this is Florida. You think Florida you could State. just join? <laughs> Thank you for joining us. I'm Ginger Gaston, not a Mensa member. <laughs> and, and I'm not Austin, Matt. never a Mensa member. <laughs> Stay with us as we check out the incredible discovery one man made underwater. How he found this working cell phone and what he did once he brought it back up above the water. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Florida's Fourth Estate. We live in a place that is surrounded by water. And very often, you know, you hear about scuba divers going down and they find all kinds of crazy things. We have this one story of someone finding, how many cell phones do you think are on the ocean floor? <laughs> Too late. I'm going to answer it. A lot. <laughs> well, I thought you were going to answer it. The answer can't be a lot. It, that is it's not scientific. How, that is scientific. And how many cell phones do you think are on the ocean floor found that are working? 
Uh, too late. One. One. <laughs> <laughs> And we have the guy who found a cell phone. It was zipped up and it's still working. Yeah, that's right. This is Alex Schultz. And uh, we, we, we found him because he found this actual working brand new iPhone on the ocean floor and then was able to return it to the person who lost it, which I'm sure that person was like, oh, what was that? I thought what? it was just out over $1,000, so thank you. Um, so we wanted to talk to him, and then we found out the reason he was out there is because he cleans up the ocean, and his company has actually cleaned up just now 30 million pounds of plastic out of the ocean, which is a pretty fantastic thing. He joins us from Boca. Alex, thanks so much for joining us on Florida's Fourth Estate. Of course. Thank you guys so much for having me. I appreciate it. It's a, it's a pleasure to meet you guys. Oh, it's nice to meet you too. So can you tell us what happened? Is this a normal thing for you? I can't imagine you find like a perfect <laughs> iPhone all zipped up in the case on the ocean floor very often. But tell us what you were out doing and and how this all went down. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Four Ocean, which is an ocean cleanup company. We uh, employ full-time captains and crews around the world to collect plastic and trash out of the ocean. Uh, we manufacture and make products out of that plastic, and then we sell those products to fund our cleanups. Uh, so we employ a, a couple hundred captains and crews around the world. And just like you said, we're stoked. We just hit uh, an amazing milestone of 30 million pounds of trash from the ocean. So incredibly, incredibly stoked and appreciative of, uh, of that amazing milestone. But uh, yeah, recently came across uh, you know doing a dive cleanup here in Boca Raton, just cleaning up uh, Lake Boca. And that's an area that's like a sandbar. A lot of people go on the weekends and they'll hang out and grill and, and have a good time there and uh, and found a bunch of stuff. I, I always find all sorts of debris, sunglasses, beer cans, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, trash along those lines, but came across a an iPhone. And I found iPhones in the past, but most of the time they're, they're basically all locked up or, or the salt water has just kind of destroyed them. But this one was in a waterproof case and uh, found it. It appeared to be in great condition. Uh, brought it back to our office where I was able to charge it and then looked at the emergency contacts on the lock screen. And lo and behold, there was a, a contact said, mom, gave it a call. And uh, and the woman answered and said, oh, my God, I can't believe you found my son's phone. He lost it, you know, a few days ago. And, uh, and she came on over here to our, our office and we were able to return it. And uh, and it was amazing. Oh my gosh, mom, the call is coming from the ocean. That is fantastic. that is the equivalent of finding like a tic tac in the ocean because once those things are gone, they're gone and you certainly don't get them back in working condition. Did you get the name of that uh, case that it was in? <laughs> I, I don't, but it was a waterproof case. I think they got off of Amazon, but it was one of those traditional ones with the plastic closure that you, you, you yeah. pull and, and snap shut, yeah. It was a great ad for the, for the cell phone case company. I can That's tell you that. <laughs> Your love of the water is what really has driven you to make sure that it is always there and clean for all of us to use, really. How did it come yeah. about that 4Ocean is something that is your your passion? Sure. So so I grew up on the west coast of Florida on a small island and uh and, and I've always spent all my time on or in the water. So I'm a licensed captain. Uh, I surf, I dive, I do everything. Everything that I do in my free time revolves around the ocean. Uh, and, and thankfully with, with my career. So, uh, I went to FAU over here, uh, in Boca Raton and, uh, got a degree in, in business management and entrepreneurship. And I always knew that I wanted to start a business around something I was passionate about. And, uh, you know, it actually happened with a, a surf trip to Bali with a buddy of mine. And that's where we saw a crazy amount of plastic on the coastlines and the, and the shorelines. And we wanted to find a way that we could employ captains and crews to collect plastic. And uh, that's where we came up with the idea to sell products uh, to, that could fund the cleanup of additional plastic from the ocean. So uh, we started back in 2017 and, and it started with just my buddy and I, and, and it took off very quickly. Uh, we grew to hundreds of employees and we set up cleanup infrastructures uh, all around the world. We've got headquarters in Florida, uh, in Bali, in Java, in Guatemala. Um, and we are able to, unfortunately, end up to uh, employ hundreds of captains and crews around the world. Anytime you have that kind of rapid growth, it captures everyone's attention. So they're wondering, okay, what are these guys doing? What are they really about? And you know, you guys sell the bracelets, right? And yep. and that has caused a lot of controversy. But we we try to do our due diligence here on Florida's Fourth sure. Estate and just look for 
like I, I looked up your rating as a charity and you got 99%. But why do you think it is that people are so obsessed with the fact that these bracelets sell for about 20 bucks and mm -hmm. they are confused by what you guys do with that money? Sure, sure. So, so we're actually a public benefit corporation. So think of Patagonia or Tom Shoes, uh, Ben and Jerry's, companies like that that have a business model. So, so we are not actually a 501c3. Uh, it is a public benefit corporation. And what we do is we collect that plastic from the ocean, we make products, and we sell them. Uh, so think of uh, and, and a one for one model of removing one pound of trash from the ocean uh, is comparable to like Tom Shoes, uh, in, in a sense. Um, and, and I think for us, that's been, a, that's been a big focus of us is scaling our cleanups around the world and, and hiring more captains and crews and just expanding uh, our operations as much as possible. Uh, we've got some innovative tech. We've got some, uh, some new exciting things that we're doing as far as expansion uh, location wise. And we're just doing everything we can to really push our cleanups forward. Everybody thinks you have to do something grand or, or start a charity or start a business to, to clean up uh, the ocean or even the planet. What is your advice to people who they want to do something, but they just don't know what they can do or how to start? You had to start somewhere. Sure, sure. I, I think that's, that's exactly it. It's just to start. Uh, it's very, it can be very intimidating. I mean, when you take a step back and think about uh, how much plastic is entering the ocean in the first place and what we're doing, you know, it can be overwhelming. But I think at the end of the day, it's all about putting that first step forward and and trying to make a change. Because for us, it, it's never my wildest dreams what I think that we'd be where we are today. I mean, 30 million pounds is like mind blowing to me. Uh, you know, when we first started, we thought that we could, you know, make a make a small impact. And, and now we're able to employ hundreds of people. I think for anybody out there that wants to start, that is the most important part. Put that first step forward. Try it out. Uh, I say this a lot. Seek advice from those who know. You know, try and find people that have had experience. Look for mentors. Look for coaches. Buy anybody that cup of coffee. Be a you know, do anything you can to try and and just be a sponge. And and most people you'll find that you know ha have had a ton of experience. Really appreciate people that are are eager and hungry and and want to learn and want to build something and want to have an impact in the world. Alex, thirty million pounds. That's a lot of trash out there i'm yes. curious of two things what is the most common thing you guys and your crews find and what sure. is the craziest thing that you guys have found while out there in the ocean i'd say i'd say the most common thing that we find is is single-use plastics it's the plastics that are consumed in a, in a couple minutes time and then they're tossed and and they last forever so this is the the polyethylene terephthalate bottles the plastic soda bottles water bottles uh, the multi-layer packaging, the sachets, the water bags, all the different items that are, are kind of like chip bags and, and things along those lines. Um, and then just a lot of rigid plastics, high density polyethylene. Um, so think of like buckets and uh, laundry detergent bottles and things like that. So it's a lot of the single use plastics that we're finding. That's the most common form of plastic. I'd say the crazy thing, we're definitely still waiting on that band $100 bills. I haven't found that one just yet, but uh, <laughs> But uh, I'd have to say our crews actually have come across like a, a, a few dead bodies. Um, wow. You know, it's, it's been, yeah, it's been pretty heavy, uh, you know, out, out in these different areas. So um, that's probably the gnarliest thing that we found. But uh, the coolest thing, I think, is this iPhone that works and, and brought it back, though. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking, I don't know, we, we always have the stories of like a pallet of cocaine washing up on the shore. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, We're, I don't know. No, no square groupers yet. No square groupers yet. <laughs> no square <Yeah>. groupers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's great. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for for caring about our planet and especially caring about our ocean, because if you live in Florida, that's we need that's it. our bread and butter right there. We have to have it. We want it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Alex Schultz for Ocean. Uh, thank you, guys. 30 million pounds of uh, plastic pulled out of the oceans and one very important iPhone to somebody out there, I would imagine. Alex, thanks so much for being Absolutely. on Florida's Fourth Estate. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Really appreciate you having me. Have a great day. And thank you for watching. You can download Florida's Fourth Estate from wherever you listen to podcasts or watch anytime on News 6 Plus. And while you're there, check out the episode where we go beyond the gate of Super Nintendo World or this episode where we talk to two Florida Python hunters. There are also live cams. Hundreds of people sit down just to enjoy the beach from home, overlook the city beautiful, or watch the cruise ships come in. It's all available for free on New 6 Plus. Just download the New 6 Plus app for your smart TV and keep watching.